Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Digital Helen Keller Archive Education Project, teaching a fully accessible online collection presentation. Before we begin, I would like to discuss some meeting logistics. All attendees are being muted and video is turned off. This is to prevent background noise and save bandwidth. The chat box is also turned off for this webinar, so please use the Q&A box to submit questions and comments to the presenters. If you're having technical difficulties, please reach out to Stephanie Bricking or Betsy Hedler for assistance, and I will put that information in the chat box. You can follow the meeting on Twitter using the hashtag SOAAM20. Finally, the session is being recorded and a link will be sent to all SOA attendees after the meeting. Throughout the presentation, there will be breaks for questions. Any questions you have can be asked then, or you can wait till the end of the presentation. Again, use the Q&A box to submit questions. Before we start, let me introduce our speakers. As Communications Director for the American Foundation of the Blind, Elizabeth Neal leads content strategy for the organization, ensuring that AFB's digital offerings remain inclusive, accessible, and user-friendly. Helen Selsden is the project director for a national endowment of the Humanities Funded Initiative to digitize and make accessible Helen Keller's archival collection. From 2002 to 2019, Ms. Selsden oversaw the care of AFB's historical collections, including the Helen Keller Archive, the Talking Book Archive, the AFB Archive, and the MC Miguel Rare Book Collection. I will now turn it over to Elizabeth and Helen. Helen, you need to unmute. Hi everyone, I'm unmuted now. <laughs> okay, welcome. My name's Helen Selsden. Um, thank you to Brittany and SOA. With me, um, I am the archivist at the American Foundation for the Blind and the director of the Helen Keller Archive Digitization Project. With me is Elizabeth Neal, Director of Communications. It's fantastic to have an opportunity to talk about Helen Keller's archival collection and AFB's project to digitize her archive and create curricula for middle and high school students. The title of our session, as you can see, is the Helen Keller Archive, Teaching a Fully Accessible Digital Archive. The photo on this first slide is of a gorgeous little girl wearing pink glasses. AFB is committed to kids' education and to speaking up for kids who are blind and visually impaired. We're striving to make sure that students with visual impairments have exactly the same opportunities to succeed as their sighted peers. And this digitization project is part of that mammoth effort. So next slide. All right, Helen Keller was AFB's champion. She worked at AFB from 1924 until her death in 1968 when her collection was bequeathed to us. Um, since then, we have been committed to, to, to disseminating her archive and its rich history and to the widest possible um, audience that we can get. This image is taken at AFB's headquarters in Manhattan in 1954. Helen is testing a new electric braille writer. She's seated in the middle with four AFB staff members around her, as well as Peter J. Salmon, the executive director of the Industrial Home for the Blind in Brooklyn. He's the gentleman with um, standing um, with the, so he looks white hair on the top. He was a fantastic fellow. Um, and also, last but absolutely not least, is Polly Thompson sitting next to Helen Keller. Polly was Helen's assistant and companion. Um, as Brittany mentioned, um, we, um, uh, we secured funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities for this project. That was in 2015. Um, we received funding to make the collection available free of charge and fully accessible to blind, deaf, hard of hearing, deaf, blind, sighted, and hearing audiences alike. This is the most accessible collection currently available that we know of anywhere. Um, and it's obviously, of course, fully accessible to users of assistive devices. 
The success of this first round of funding resulted in additional funding in 2018 for a second phase to digitize the press clippings and scrapbooks and to create online curricula for middle and high school students to use in classrooms worldwide. So what's in the collection? Here are just two of the over 80,000 items in the archive. The left-hand image shows Helen again with Polly Thompson standing in the street. Um, okay, you're standing in the street in Manhattan outside Tiffany's jewelry store. Helen is on the left and Polly's on the right. And the digitized image on the right is a letter written in 1919 from the American Civil Liberties Union to Helen asking for her help to work in protecting civil liberties. The Helen Keller Archive is the single largest repository of materials by and about Helen Keller. These materials include correspondence, speeches, press clippings, scrapbooks, photographs, photographic albums, architectural drawings, audio recordings, and artifacts. They, they span from the late 19th century well into the 20th. And just a little bit of history back here. Helen was born in 1880. She died in 1968. She was likely the most recognized person with a disability in the 20th century and used her extraordinary popularity, not only as an advocate on behalf of those with disabilities, but also as a feminist, suffragist, social activist, pacifist, and published author. She wrote 14 books and hundreds of essays and articles on a broad, a broad range of subjects, ranging from animals, to Atomic Energy, to Mahatma Gandhi, and all these aspects of her life are chronicled in the collection. There are now over 186,000 digital images up online with tens of thousands of transcri uh, transcriptions and their metadata. So next slide, why are we doing this? Digitizing the Helen Keller archive presented AFB really with a unique and golden opportunity to maximize the power of the collection to educate the public and future generations about Helen and disability history. So I've selected two images for this slide, mainly to give you a sense of the breadth of her life and also because they're just fabulous and I wanted to include them. So the first image is the earliest known example of Helen's handwriting in our collection. It's from 1887. It's a series of simple words such as cat, cold, load. Keller wrote this page of words in June 1887 when she had just turned seven years of age, okay? The second image is of Helen holding an Oscar in 1955. This was an honorary Academy Award which she was presented as the inspiration for the documentary film Helen Keller in her story. These items illustrate an obstacle that we faced in dispelling the myth of Helen. The first image shows, a, obviously a, reflects a precocious, seemingly exceptional little girl who in just three months learned to communicate and indeed learned to spell basic words. And the second depicts what many would see sort of like this extraordinary, beautiful, saintly old lady. Helen was ne neither. She was neither a genius nor a saint, far from it. She loved her alcohol. She was made of real flesh and blood and worked extraordinarily hard to change the world around her. She championed the underdog and she did it tirelessly. Her work as an advocate for those with disabilities spanned from the early 20th century until the 1960s. As such, her archive is also a rich resource on the history of advocacy for those with vision loss in the US and globally during the 20th century. Very importantly, people who are blind, deaf and deaf blind have for the most part been relegated from the historical record and digitizing this archival collection is a powerful way to bring disability history into the mainstream where it belongs. We're especially excited that the site can be used by students with vision and hearing loss. With this fully accessible digital archive, students who are blind and visually impaired can independently enjoy the thrill of discovering primary and secondary source materials for themselves. This archive, of course, it's, if you, I hope you all get to look at it, it's an incredible unique source of information on social, cultural and political change in America. It contains correspondence from nine US presidents, as well as luminaries such as Mark Twain, Pearl S. Buck, and Albert Einstein, to name really very, very few of the incredible people in it. 
Digitizing the collection is a fabulous way to capture and preserve our archive for generations to come. And I don't have to tell a whole bunch of archivists that it's an awesome way to make sure that the materials really get preserved and that people don't touch them all the time. It increases the longevity, obviously. And people can look remotely. All right, so challenging stereotypes. In June 2018, we had a party that celebrated the public launch of the first phase of the project. This party was held at the New York Institute for Special Ed Education in the Bronx. Prior to the celebration, we went to the school and demoed the digital archive to visually impaired fifth graders. They were really awesome. At the end of the project, we asked the students what they thought of the digital archive and the project as a whole. And one student, this um, Wani, on, pictured on the right in this image here, he said, Helen Keller means the world to blind, visually impaired or deaf people because she fought for our rights. She helped us to be like everybody else. Helen's story can embolden the next generation of school kids to understand that anything is possible if you put your mind to it. So this digital archive represents a powerful vehicle for continuing the work begun by Helen and AFB to build a more inclusive world. Next slide. So this is our roadmap of today's presentation. Liz and I will alternately lead you through key, through key aspects of the project. Liz is about to talk about how we made the collection fully accessible and the importance of making all websites accessible. I'll then discuss the digitization process itself, metadata creation, transcription. I'll then take you on a brief tour of our wonderful archive. And then Liz will circle back to discuss the huge potential of the site as an educational tool. But a quick shout out to Madeline Fix. Maddie, we hope you're out there. Maddie was the project manager for the curricular project. And um, she brought us to the Society of Ohio Archivists and your annual conference. So we're truly thank, huge thanks to you, Maddie, for doing that. So Liz, take, away, take it away with accessibility. Okay, whoops, let me get to the next slide. All right. I think I skipped one there. What is accessibility? It's important to start with an understanding of what we mean here. So at AFB, we define accessibility as the design and development of a website that allows everyone, including people with disabilities, to independently use and interact with it. Um, the World Wide Web Consortium, which I hope all of you are familiar with, um, in their web accessibility initiative, specified that people with disabilities should be able to perceive understand, navigate, and interact with the web as well as contribute to it. And that's something that's obviously very important to us at the American Foundation for the Blind. Um, it fits with our mission to create a world of no limits for people who are blind or visually impaired. Um, but it's also critical to our work because um, we obviously have many staff who are blind or low vision who need to be able to independently build and maintain all of our digital services. Um, so I'm going to briefly cover some very basic approaches to creating an accessible digital collection and including my favorite topic, the importance of inclusive user testing. And I'll end it with um, some of what we learned from our own user testing and how we used that feedback to improve this digital collection. All right, so why make your archive site accessible? If I leave you with only one thing today, I hope it's this. Disability is not an edge case. Um, according to the CDC, one in five Americans has a disability of some kind. And according to our research department at the American Foundation for the Blind, over 26 million Americans are blind or low vision, meaning that they have trouble seeing even when wearing glasses or contact lenses. So every time you create a digital record or share an item online, you're either including or excluding users with disabilities based on your approach to the item. Are you assuming that everyone can access information visually or by listening to it? Or have you allowed for multiple types of access to information? And that's something we're gonna keep circling back to in this presentation. Um, I should note there are laws that also require the accessibility of some websites. Um, and in, in addition, obviously the Helen Keller archive is of particular interest to people with disabilities. It would be shameful if 
scholars and historians who are deafblind or, or blind or hard of hearing couldn't independently access these wonderful primary sources. And finally, making an inclusive site is just the right thing to do. Accessibility will broaden the base of users who can take advantage of your resources. So in case that wasn't enough to convince you, let's look a little bit further into how accessibility improves your site. And I hope my little uh, illustration here gives you a hint. It's a, a cartoon of a little robot spider. Um, so first and foremost, cross-browser and cross-device compatibility. Accessibility um, requires clean, flexible markup, and that makes your site more accessible, but it also makes it play nicely with cell phones and tablets and giant desktop monitors, um, as well as the less common browsers that you might not test with, but are used by people with disabilities. Better discoverability. This is something that's hugely important to all of us, right? Um, accessibility techniques are also search engine optimization techniques. An accessible site is a discoverable site. So if you use correct markup and add meaningful descriptions of your content and explicitly label items in the archive, that all improves what a search engine can identify within your site and display to users. Correct markup actually will improve your search engine standings. Um, if you mark up the structure and content of your site correctly, search engine bots, um, and go back to our little spider there, will understand what's important and unique about your pages. So page titles uniquely identify each item in the Helen Keller archive. Headings let a screen reader user know where the main content of the page begins and what the most important summary info is. Um, but it also tells the search engine uh, what the most important information on the page is. And text within headings and page titles is generally weighted more heavily in search results. So if you use those correctly, you're helping real users and you're improving your search engine placement. All right, because I can't let it go, I'm just going to go a little deeper into the power of text equivalents. Um, Images are much more searchable if you provide complete descriptions. Um, that makes the full detail of the picture more discoverable for users and, and via search engines. Video and audio transcripts. This is something that frequently um, gets skipped, um, but if you transcribe your multimedia content into a text equivalent, then it can be indexed by search engines and independently accessed by for example, someone who's using a refreshable Braille device. Um, so a user who is deafblind can come to the Helen Keller archive and still take advantage of the video and audio content. And we're gonna show you examples of these transcripts and some of the detailed image descriptions in action when Helen takes you through a demo of the site in just a minute. So it's not complicated. I wanna stress that honestly, if you start with valid HTML, you're halfway there or, or more than halfway there. Uh, we've got a little illustration here of a very cheerful skeleton um, to represent the good bones of a site, which is what valid HTML does for you. So use headings, label your forms, provide alt text for images and, and make sure they're meaningful, um, well-written descriptions. Uh, this will come up later, but if you, if you misspell things in alt text, a screen reader is going to pronounce it the way you typed it. So make sure you're, you're paying some attention to that as well. And there are free tools out there to be able to check your code. It's a great first step. Um, just use the W3C validator to make sure that your HTML passes muster. It'll catch a lot of little glitches for you. Um, one other thing that I wanted to leave you with is just a quick um, test that you can pro do on your own sites using a traditional keyboard. So it's nothing fancy, but this is a great way to check if your site is navigable without a mouse. So it should be obvious, but keyboard accessibility is actually a really critical component of web accessibility. Um, users who are blind or low vision frequently use the traditional keyboard arrows and tab keys to navigate the screen rather than a pointing device like a mouse. And um, actually users with mobility impairments also use those techniques or sometimes a modified keyboard to accommodate tremors or missing limbs. So here are some quick tips that you can use on your own digital assets. Use tab to move through the links. Shift tab lets you go backward. Enter to select a link or button, 
and alt left arrow to go back a page. Now that's the combination for Windows. I apologize, I don't remember the version for Mac, but these are all available on Mac as well. Um, you will find if you are trying to navigate a site with a keyboard, one of the banes of your existence will be pop-ups or those little dialogue windows. Try to avoid those as, a, as an interface technique. Um, they can be made accessible, but it's a little tricky to do so. It pulls focus. So all of a sudden, a screen reader user is in a new window. So it kind of breaks the back button, which is a, a key tool for getting around. Um, sometimes those pop-up windows aren't labeled. So you're in a new place and you don't know where you are. Um, so it can be very disorienting or at least a little bit annoying. And um, so I would highly recommend trying to avoid those if you can. All right, and I wanted to give, and let's see if this works. Um, ah, okay, I did a little screen capture. It doesn't have sound, so I'll narrate, but this is an example of someone um, navigating the Helen Keller archive just using keyboard controls. So you can see the pointer is not moving, but the focus is the person is navigating through the menu and getting up to the search field. And then they're, okay, she's typing in Empire State Building and then hitting go. And now we've got search results for Empire State Building. You can jump to the results on the Helen Keller archive using, again, keyboard and navigate right into the item itself. And you can even use the viewer display controls with keyboard combinations, which are clearly labeled there. So Control Alt Z to zoom in, Control Alt O to zoom out. So this is all being done just with the keyboard and um, it means that somebody who, a teacher who's blind or low vision could show, you know, a class full of sighted students an image in the Helen Keller archive. So that was really important to us that all of those features were fully accessible. All right. How to go about creating a beautifully accessible site. One thing I cannot recommend highly enough is assembling a diverse team and getting a variety of access methods on your planning committee and ideally your development team from the start. So hire people with disabilities. <laughs> um, not only will the different access methods make you think about the information in new ways, um, you're gonna just have a variety of approaches that are gonna surface issues sooner and foster innovation and creativity. And it genuinely saves you so much time because um, it, when those problems crop up earlier, you can just fix them in a way that fixes them site-wide. So uh, that was our big advantage at the American Foundation for the Blind is that we did have a diverse team of um, developers with various access methods, but one or even two users is never gonna be enough, right? We, we know that people have different preferences on how they access information. Um, even if they happen to share an access method. So we recruited a really terrific team of usability testers. We got input from 19 participants, which is a little bit larger than um, you probably heard the rule of five and, and that's fantastic. And definitely always make some time for usability testing. Even a small group of users giving feedback is gonna be so helpful and you'll, you'll learn a ton. Um, we cast a really wide net because we did want to get a very wide range of um, perspectives, people from age 10 through teenagers, college students, adults, retirees. Um, we had people who were deafblind, who were um, low vision, which is a slightly different set of um, access preferences than people who are blind and using screen readers. And we just, we learned so much um, from doing that. I will say one of the ways we were able to catch, cast such a wide net was we did the testing remotely, and this is even prior um, to our current situation. I highly recommend it. Actually, it allows people to access the site on their own device with their own preferred setup, and it really gives you a sense of um, how they're gonna encounter your, your site in the real world. So let's get into briefly some of the things we learned. People did not know what an archive even was. <laughs> and this had um, major implications for how we had designed the site. We had um, designed the homepage to kind of guide people into the simple search, but it was leading to frustration. It was not giving users the best experience um, because they were coming to our sort of narrow but deep um, archive collection 
with Google-like expectations. So they were casting a really wide net, sort of using vague search terms and hoping for the best. Um, they weren't aware of what was in the collection. And so we made some changes as a result of that feedback to guide users to the browsing options, which again, Helen's gonna show you here, um, which really help reveal the structure of the archive, its organization and its contents and, and sets people up for success because they have a better idea of what's actually there. Um, I won't get too deep into this, but another thing that we found was that um, the read order of the page was hindering discovery of some of our features that we were so proud of. Um, we have these great refined search tools and um, the way we had laid out the page, people who were accessing the site on like tablets or cell phones or screen readers um, were not even finding them because they were so far down the page. So we wound up moving those up and then giving people a way to skip past them as you saw in the keyboard demo um, but they're there so that if you're new to the site you will encounter those features because they are really useful all right i'm going to pause here for questions um because i know that's a big topic accessibility and so if there are any questions before we move on to the next portion of the presentation i'm happy to take those now there is actually a question uh, there's a comment. Um, Madeline is here and she is watching the presentation. And the question is, what software did you use to make your PDFs accessible? We have mm. run into issues in making our scanned documents accessible PDFs. Yeah, we actually didn't use software. Um, there are tools that run accessibility checks. Um, at AFB, we're very lucky to have experienced um, screen reader users and screen magnification users on staff. So we rely on human review and, um, and then, but there are tools built into um, accessibility creation tools that um, help sort of spotlight some of those issues and, and guide you through the remediation. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, there are no other questions at this time. You may continue. Okay, I'm gonna hand it back to Helen here, who's gonna walk us through, am I? All right, next slide, there we go. The digitization process. Okay, so this slide is entitled Digitization with Accessibility in Mind. The digitization process, as I'm sure many of you already know, is it's super complex um, at the best of times. But this particular collection is particularly so, um, not just because of the large variety of formats of material in the archive, but also because accessibility is such a factor, such an important factor. We chose um, a vendor, um, turned out to be a wonderful um, choice. Um, this was Hudson Archival in Port Ewan in upstate New York. They're led by their indomitable president, Toya Dubin. Um, I say they were fantastic because sadly they are no longer in the digitization business. However, they continue to work as a consulting company for digitization projects. So we highly recommend them if you need help with managing your collections or indeed writing grants. Toya was my partner in crime when it came to writing grants. Um, so the image on this slide is one of Hudson Archival's camera stations um, set up with three sources of light to create the best possible image. Um, indeed, Hudson spent a great deal of time working out the best ways to shoot the materials. They used techniques such as advanced book handling systems at camera stations, selecting cool lighting that was gentle to materials, carefully defining image resolutions to allow for significant zoom and pan on each image. These are key issues for the accessibility. And then there was OCR. For those of you unfamiliar with OCR, which stands for Optical Character Recognition, this is a software program that reviews every pixel in an image and converts it to text. Um, defining OCR rules at the outset was very important to allow for transcription of handwritten materials while still getting as much searchability as possible of typewritten materials. So on this page slide, I've also written one page at a time because it took an enormous amount of patience to shoot the over 186,000 digital images. So 
we thought we knew it all. And then along came Braille. So this was a major bump in the road um, when it came to shooting Braille materials and to making those little raised bumps clear and discernible. But of course, Hudson conquered it. Um, the solution required special lighting angles, increased contrast, um, et cetera, et cetera, to get a good representation of the original image while ensuring that the Braille is readable. And then we all investigated to see if there is an OCR system or a program that can read Braille, right? Our thinking was that, was this, was that this would facilitate full transcription of Braille items, but as it turns out, it doesn't yet exist. Um, the way we now compensate for this is by having volunteers who can sight read Braille and provide transcriptions. And then there are the thousands of pieces of metadata. And here's our metadata queen, Stephanie Molnar, who worked on the project for over two and a half years. Um, she led our metadata team and uh, metadata assistants. She oversaw the subject taxonomy. Stephanie worked to make sure that metadata systems created uniform and consistent metadata. You can't have one person describing the document, the subject matter in one way and another, another person another way, because then search results will be hopeless. So tens of thousands of pieces of rich metadata are central to this unique archive and the functionality of the site and, um, and a visitor's ability to search the system. Um, many of you will probably be interested to know that we began with Dublin Core as the main framework for the metadata, but then we, our collection is so specific, we made alterations and came up with our own um, uh, additions to address things like Braille and transcriptions. Then there was our volunteer transcription team. Um, on this slide are four examples of handwriting that span from the late 19th century to the 20th. Each contains a few words that illustrates the variety of the handwriting in the collection, and this is really varied. These, obviously, these handwritten documents cannot be properly read by OCR. So our team of volunteer transcribers are needed to transcribe the documents. Um, we recruited over 40 uh, transcribers. We used idealist.org to begin our original recruitment effort. Um, Toya personally trains each transcriber and, refu and reviews their work. Currently, there are more than 10,000 items that have been transcribed or received OCR correction, but there's way more to do. And I'm always, um, if any of you out there would like to transcribe for us, please do contact me. And especially if you could, um, if you can sight read Braille or have, um, can read foreign languages. We have someone um, working on French text, but other languages would be awesome as would more French speaking people. Um, all you need is a, the, an internet connection and a computer. And we can, we can teach you exactly how to do this. And it's actually super fun. So the results of our hard work, here's the main page of our website. And I am, we are both thrilled to point out the fourth tab along, lesson plans. This new tab heralds the arrival just last week of our new curricular lesson plans that Liz will describe shortly. So let's begin a tour of the archive. Browse function. We'll start our tour by searching for an essay Helen wrote in 1933. The essay, Three Days to See, describes her thoughts and feelings if she had vision for three days. She takes us on a wonderful tour of New York City. It's really beautiful. And I, I hope you do take the time to read it after this session. And so using the browse by series function, we start at the series level and select writings by and about Helen Keller then we search for box 231 that contains writing by Helen T through U. The essay three days to see on the right hand graphic is located in folder seven. As you can see the red arrow um, indicating the thumbnail of the document we're looking for. So that's browse, uh, that's the browse function. And here is the actual text. 
Um, this is just one page of the document Three Days to See. On the top half of the page, the object itself is, is presented and the user is invited to adjust the size or skip between images. And as Liz was explaining, for those using assistive technology, that you can tap, you can use your um, keyboard controls. But um, for those with vision, you can um, use the zoom in, zoom out, fit with, with width um, tab um, icons there. Just so as you know, it's very, it's very easily to conf easy to confuse images with items. There can be many, many images in a single item. So this page that you're seeing is just one digital image belonging to um, uh, one, an item that's made up of three images. Okay, so listening to an item, okay? And when we say listen to an item, in this instance, I'm not talking about listening to a recording. Rather, sort of this refers to the synthesized speech that will be heard by someone using assistive technology to read and listen to the text. So accessibility is key. This is, this is super, super important. Um, below the title and image are the transcription on the left, created by our amazing um, volunteers, and on the right is the metadata. Obviously, a clean, legible transcription is essential if you have a visual impairment. Without a good transcription, a screen reader cannot read the text and the image is pretty useless. What we're going to do now is we're going to have you listen to the text as it, as it will be heard by someone using assistive, assistive technology. And a quick heads up that first you'll hear the navigation instructions and then the text itself. So, Liz, maybe we could do this. Space. Check. Stop recording. Helen, Helen Keller's essay Three Days to See outlining her plans if she had sight for Three Days Water Fox Classic. Helen Keller. About the archive link. He, browse link. Search link. Help link heading level 2. Helen Keller's essay Three Days to See outlining her plan. Viewer displaying image 11 of transcription of the link. Why may this blank? 11 Three Days. Read full transcription of this item visited link. Transcription for Helen Keller's essay Three Days to See Outlining Her Plans If She Had Sight for Three Days Document Busy, Blank. Visited link Skip to Content. About the Browse link, Search link, Help link, Transcription for Helen Keller's essay Three Days to See Outlining Her Plans If She Had Sight for Three Days Heading Level 1. Find Dialogue. T today. Today I shall spend in the workaday world of the present, amidst the haunts of living men going about the business of life. And where can one find so many activities and states of men as in New York, so the city becomes my destination. I start from my home in the quiet, homey little suburb of Forest Hills, Long Island, here, surrounded by green lawns, trees, and flowers, our neat little homes, happy with the voices and movements of wives and children, havens of peaceful rest for men who toil in the city. I drive across the lacy structure of steel which spans the East River, and I get a new and startling vision of the power and ingenuity of the mind of man. Busy boats chug and scurry about the river, racy speedboats, stolid, snorting tugs. If I had long days of sight ahead, I should spend many of watching this delightful game of the busy boats. Twelve three days I look ahead, and before me rise the fantastic towers of New York, a city that seems to have stepped from the pages of a fairy story. What an awe-inspiring sight, these glittering spires, these vast banks of stone and steel, such structures as the gods might build for themselves. This it's really beautiful. OBS there we go. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic piece. Um, that is a very slowed down version of what someone with, uh, who uses assistive technology would often listen to. So it's, it's quite amazing, actually. And if you're not used to it, it's even more extraordinary. So here we go. Next slide. Now to browse by subject. This is a great way to explore the breadth and depth of this particular archive. Um, this, um, the browse by subject function allows the user to explore the site using Library of Congress subject descriptions. Um, Helen Keller read, wrote, and traveled widely, and her curiosity was boundless. The result is a crazy rich archive with a huge subject taxonomy. And 
if you have no knowledge of what's contained in the archive, it's almost a brilliant way to find out what's in it. You can almost look at chapters in a book. It helps you, otherwise you'd have no sense of the breadth of her archive. So it's a, it's a very, very useful function. I'm going to use the subject of Lions Clubs International to illustrate the function itself, browse by subject. And more specifically, I want to search for speech Helen gave in Cedar Point, Ohio in 1925. So I first go to the browse by subject tabs shown here on the slide. I then scroll down to organization, Lions Club International. And once I've chosen this category, I click on it and I see the red arrow as indicated by the red arrow, up comes items, including a thumbnail of the item that I'm looking for. And here is the item itself. Um, she gave this speech in 1925. She was addressing Lions members and challenging them to become Knights of the Blind. Actually, in blindness history, this is a massively important moment, so Ohioans can be very proud of this. Um, Helen encouraged everyone to participate in fundraising and work on behalf of people who are blind and visually impaired. And that's exactly what the Lions, Lions members went away and did and continue to do today. They're actually funders of this project as well. So we're, we're really grateful to the Lions clubs. Um, as with the previous item, if you were in the actual system right now and you were to look below the image, again, you would find the full transcription on the left and the metadata on the right. So, um, refining a search. This is another fruitful way to use this powerful tool. Um, there are, you can use filters that enable you to refine your search. I wouldn't be me if I didn't give you, make, take this opportunity to give you a little bit of the history of Helen and AFB. So she was our champion. She crisscrossed the nation between 1924 and 1958 and personally appeared before at least 13 state legislatures and targeted 18 with demands that included the creation of state commissions for the blind and the construction of schools for people with vision loss. At the federal level, she successfully lobbied the government to distribute books in Braille for use by the adult blind across the US. And from 1942 to 1944, she supported Senator Robert Wagner's efforts to secure funding for the rehabilitation, special vocational training, placement and supervision of blind persons including those blinded in World War II. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was just at the government level. The whole, the whole while she was doing all that kind of um, effort, that kind of advocacy, she was relentlessly traveling the nation as AFB's ambassador and fundraising on our behalf. Within the first three years of her working for AFB, from 1924 until 27, she addressed 250,000 people at 249 venues in 123 cities. She was a powerhouse fundraiser. So let's see, here we go. Using the faceted, faceted search, in other words, the filters, we can drill down and search the archive to see if Helen spoke in Ohio at that time. The filters in this digital archive include categories such as type of material, subject, decade, person from, person to, and it goes on. Um, so are there any press clippings of, O'Hella, of Helen um, speaking in Ohio? Going to the search function, and this is where we finally get to this slide, going to the search function, I type in Ohio in the search bar. This returns 5,578 results. In the left-hand column under category, I select press clipping. This returns 1,089 results. And then I select decade 1920 to 29, and this reduces the results to 57. And here we have an example of one of the hits. This is Helen speaking in Dayton, Ohio. It was the fifth um, link down on the results page. And um, we have many such scrapbooks and, and they're chock full of all the work that she did, including going to Ohio. So, and just because I can't stop myself, I've got to show you these two items. Statements of receipts for April 8th, 1933 at Ohio State University, Columbus, Ohio. Um, this, I got to this, just to explain another simple search. In this case, 
Um, I typed in the word Ohio. I got 5,578 hits. I then chose blindness hyphen fundraising, subject in the taxonomy, with my results, um, which were reduced to 369 hits. I then chose decade, 1930 to 1939, with the result that my hits were reduced to 59 results. I then find and chose this, um, this item. I just couldn't resist sharing it. It contains a list of the donations. Um, um, AFB was sent this letter. Uh, it was, it, AFB sent the letter, hold on, from AFB's office, Mildred uh, manager, the manager, Mildred Rothmeyer, um, to Ohio State University in Columbus, confirming receipt of $582 and 19 cents in donations received by AFB that resulted from Helen speaking at the university, okay? This is an amazing document. If you were to, I can send you the link later, but if you were to cl get in close, you can see the, the relatively large amount for 1933. It's a depression and people are just lining up to give her their, their two, three dollars. And then on the right, there are those who are giving 20 cents, 30 cents, 40 cents. Her work as a fundraiser was tireless, and this was extremely, extremely hard work. And AFB, we fundraise today. I am still fundraising for the digitization project. So our work continues with as much gusto, but you know, we hope that Helen, we have as much energy as Helen had then to keep going. So any questions? There are currently no questions at this time. Okay. All right. Well, we'll forge ahead then, um, and we'll have time for questions at the end, too, if you guys think of anything later. Um, I'm going to move into the curricula project. Um, so Helen showed you, this was fantastic to have this massive amount of digital information available, but now we have the task ahead of us of disseminating it and making sure it's brought, we hope, into classrooms around the world. Um, so we started with the questions, who currently uses the archive? Who do we want to reach? How do we teach the next generation about disability history? And what do teachers need? Um, we knew thanks to our advisory group and our amazing um, users who tested the site for us, that we had created a tool that expanded access to all the wonderful items in the archive, but we wanted to make sure we had really created a useful tool for engaging students on key topics in disability history and also giving them some insight, um, again, as Helen has showed you, how Helen Keller, um, a deafblind writer and activist, was incredibly involved in lobbying on various social issues of her time and writing about them. So a year ago, we took these questions to our digitization project advisory team. Um, it's a board that's made up of leading disability and feminist historians, educators, archivists, um, technology experts. And we asked them, what's the best way to use the digital archive in an educational setting? What tools, what features should we add? And they said, ask the teachers. So we did. Um, we met with teachers at a local Brooklyn middle school and we asked them what they wanted. And they saw so many possibilities in the archive. It was really exciting. Um, they saw all sorts of ways it would connect to their work and their existing um, educational goals and curriculum. And they recommended lesson plans on every topic from basic internet literacy to the civil rights movement. Um, because again, the Helen Keller archive spans a huge portion of um, American history. So we decided we'd start at the beginning of that um, giant task. And we're so delighted to be able to share with you that the lesson plans are now live on the site thanks to the very hard work of the curricula team that we pulled together, which includes Madeline Fix, Allison Burke, and Professor Ellen Noonan, who's director of the Archives and Public History Program at NYU. And we 100% could not have done this without all of them. So here's our first lesson, which is an introduction to archives for middle school students. So going back to that question that had come up, right, in the usability testing, what is an archive? What is in it? How does it work? How is it organized? Why do you create one? Um, and then obviously we put a, a bit of an emphasis on digital archives like this one and why you would want to digitize a phys physical collection. 
So this is the lesson that we piloted um, in a classroom in December, back when you could actually still go into classrooms. <laughs> and um, this lesson really asked students to consider, you know, why and how are we saving all of this material, as well as teaching them some basic internet research skills, how to browse, how to search more effectively. That was something that really came out in the conversations with teachers that, um, People have this perception of kids as these savvy digital natives who know instinctively how to do everything and that's just not the case. They really, they need some, some training and how to search effectively and then how to analyze what they're finding. Uh, lesson two is also available and this one also uses material from the Helen Keller archive and it teaches students how to identify and use primary sources and secondary sources um, in their research and historical writing. So they learn how to differentiate between a primary and a secondary source and critically examine the authorship, the purpose and historical context of multiple primary sources. Because again, this archive has so much in it, not just um, created by Helen, but received from her in, in the scrapbooks. Um, and in the correspondence that she received from people all over the world, um, dignitaries, politicians, but also just regular people in various countries. Each lesson plan is designed to fit in one or two class periods. Um, that's the goal. <laughs> it's a lot of material, but we think it works. It includes supplementary worksheets and some links to the curriculum standards that these lessons um, connect to. So we pilot tested this again in um, Brooklyn. We went back to the teachers who had um, given us their ideas for lesson plans. And we said, okay, here's what we've got. How does this work for you? And it was totally fascinating to see, you know, the lesson plan sort of in, in practice in an actual classroom with a very experienced teacher. We were very lucky to have her um, running that class and giving us feedback after it. Um, as we mentioned, you know, accessibility is always first and foremost with AFP. So we're publishing these in just two formats, um, basic HTML pages and downloadable PDFs. We wanted to offer teachers as much flexibility as possible. We know, you know, teachers like to ha have handouts and be able to print things out, but we also wanted to make sure, you know, all of our material materials were fully accessible um, for teachers who might have sensory disabilities themselves. And obviously none of these materials are, are meant to be proscriptive. Like we fully expect teachers to customize these to their own classroom needs. And we're really excited to see what they come up with. Um, some of the keys to making these documents accessible um, was simplicity. Basically going back to that, like start with valid HTML, then create your PDFs from that. Um, keeping the layout very clean and linear. Um, we tried to avoid things like uh, complicated nested bullet point structures. That's something that's is very visual. If you think about it, it all lines up vertically and you can tell that things belong to the same list because the bullet style is slightly different. But when you're navigating that with a screen reader, it can be very tricky to keep track of the different levels of a list. So that's just one example of ways that we try to keep the information very um, very simple and, and straightforward. But it's 100% a work in progress, so um, definitely encourage everybody to go check them out if you find any issues or if you have ideas for improvement. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and I think we're going to go into Helen talking about what's next. Yeah, so um as I'm sure many of you already found when you're digitizing your collections, it can be a very costly undertaking. Um, we're super grateful to our donors. Here we've got the logos of Humanities New York, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and American Express, all of whom are generous funders on the project. We also have the logo for edcitement.neh.gov. We're thrilled that this teaching arm of the NEH is going to host our lesson plans shortly. And what's coming next is hopefully we will have a women's suffrage lesson up um, by August to celebrate the centennial of a women's right to vote. So stay tuned for that. 
the, at the end of the day, these lessons are incredibly timely as well. The cor coronavirus has sort of made distance learning resources even more important than we actually could ever have imagined. And we're pleased to be able to provide students with online um, lessons and re resources, especially kids with disabilities. So it's been an epic journey and it hasn't ended. Um, there are two of us presenting here, but easily over 60 people have been involved in this mammoth undertaking. And it's been a labor of love. And if you learn nothing else, it really takes a village and listening to others. We hope that this presentation has given you an idea of what we've been up to and above all has inspired you to make your collections accessible as well. And, and don't forget, you're, m please do contact us as uh, Liz just said, so here's our, here's our email and contact info. So do give us a call. And now we're gonna open this, open this up to you. Do you have questions or thoughts or comments? We'd love to hear from you. I do have two questions. Mm -hmm. The first one is, what platform is your site on? Mm -hmm. Want me to take that, Helen, or do you wanna talk to that? It's on, Hudson, yeah, go for it. So, so we're using a proprietary um, software called Viridian. Um, that's the database um, structure that, that powers the site. Um, so even though it's on AFB.org, it's actually managed by the Viridian software. And then we did a little bit of an interface with WordPress to give us some uh, access to just adding articles and easier updates that are more not specific items in the database. Okay. And they've been great to work with, I should say. They, they really helped with the customization process. Um, they were very responsive to our findings from the usability tests and really worked with us to make sure the controls were fully accessible. They've been building that into their platform too. So it's really exciting to see that working with this company is making those accessibility improvements more widely available. All right, and the second question is, what do you recommend as a good first step to make your digital archive accessible? Gosh, that's a big one. Um, so <laughs> honestly, I'm going to say two things. It's a little bit cheating. Um, the first step is that skeleton, right? The good bones of your site. So valid HTML is 100% the starting point. Um, ultimately, you know, it's going online, it's still basically being delivered in HTML. It has so many robust features to provide text equivalents and labels. You wanna make sure that people can, you know, make sense of your forms, even if it's a search form, but especially if it's a more complicated search form, like that has advanced capabilities, just putting in that time to make sure that your, your code um, is taking advantage of all the labeling opportunities that HTML already provides. So valid code, and then I'm a big, big proponent of user testing. I honestly think that, um, you know, you can, you can automate your processes and you can follow good procedures, but I mean, we're the American Foundation for the Blind and we, we feel like we know what we're doing and we still right. found things that we had to fix when we brought it out to users. You always do. Yeah. So I think in the end, like it's about how user friendly it is and you, you cannot know that unless you actually talk to users. And that you really can't leave the human out of the picture at all. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And when you we need... discovered that many people don't even know what an archive is, I mean, it really takes us, it was a massive learning curve for us as well as everybody else to get the system up to where we wanted it. So I would say, yeah, usability is not usability without real users. Right. Okay. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> Happy to talk further on strategies. This is um, obviously something we've put a lot of time on, so, and uh, my heart. <laughs> right. two more questions just popped in. Uh, the first one is, was this project funded entirely by grants? Yes, and I, yes, and I, I, I led the fundraising for this project. I think it's cost us about a million dollars. We've raised 640,000 from the National Endowment for Humanities and American Express has given us money and other organizations. It's been a major effort. And I also have to say that for those of you who are feeling deterred out there from doing this, um, it, I only got my funding in 2015 after my fourth effort at writing to the NEH. 
So do not be put off. It's, it's, it's extremely difficult, but you can do it. You really, really can. And we've had an incredible program officer at the NEH. Um, so just don't give up. But yes, it, it's taken a lot of money and they're mostly organizations and corporations have funded us. Okay. And final question. You mentioned that you use Dublin Core at first, but what do you use now for your metadata? We developed our own, our own, um, not just taxonomy, but um, we, so it's a development of Dublin Core. So it's just a sort of a continuation of that, but with our own subtitles of different kinds of material. We have Braille, we, we made them up. When, we could, when they didn't exist, we made them up. I don't know how else to put it politely. <laughs> we, we just kept going with it and, and it's, it's fine. We, we tried to really stay close to standard um, descriptions and just standard ways of creating metadata. But honestly, our materials were so outside the regular realm of things that we had to just sort of move on and create our own system. Otherwise it wouldn't have really worked so well for us. I hope that answers your question. Okay. And just a last comment. Uh, thank you. It was a fantastic session. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Let's have a virtual round of applause. <laughs> thank you very much, Helen and Elizabeth. It was a great presentation. And I thank encourage you for having us. Oh, yeah, thank you. Likewise. And don't forget to contact us seriously with any questions you've got. And I encourage all of you to check out the Helen Keller archive. That concludes our session. Uh, you should have received an evaluation form. Our next presentation will be Experiencing War, a project to preserve and make accessible oral histories of World War II. Oh, we wow. will see you at 1230. Bye everyone.